Alas, we reached the last topic of your oceanography unit. I'm um, uh, sad to see that it's over and it was very short. And most definitely, you could spend a whole year breaking this down into more detail and learning more about it, especially with the life aspect of it. For those of you who really like it, um, take a marine biology class. Uh, it's offered in high school and in college. And so it's very, very interesting. And we learn about much of those things in more detail, as well as the different types of life that live in the ocean in greater detail than we ever could in the small scales of, of the Earth Space Science course. It's about time to stop surfing the waves of the internet and start surfing some real waves. Uh, we live in Florida where I teach you from right now and we don't have a lot of waves. The beach is actually very, very, very long and the barrier islands also don't, don't help much. But either way, this lecture will be actually very interesting. We're going to be talking about lots of things. We're going to be talking about waves, currents, and also tides. And we're also going to talk about erosion of the shoreline in more detail. Before we start let's talk about some basics about the structure of the ocean water as we talked about in the previous chapter that ocean water actually is broken down into three major layers we have the uh, above layer which is often referred as the photic zone which is the layer that receives the most amount of sunlight it also interacts most the most with the surface and as you go down you reach a, a layer of, of mixed material called a pyclocline and that's basically the area where the, the deep water and the top water are mixed together and then you have a deep layer that is very different from the top layer where life and interaction with the surface is much reduced. And I think of it as the big, big, big oceanic desert. It's the version, the area of the ocean that has the least life and activity. But it's not, it's not completely useless. It's got a lot of stuff going on there, including a lot of important geology and a lot of important ocean life as well. Here you see the, an example of a lot of the things which the surface layer is, is um, involved in. It's, uh, it's constantly sprayed with aerosols from the surface because of sea spray and, and wave breakers. Uh, water is evaporating constantly for, because of absorption of infrared radiation from the sun. Uh, a lot of that infrared radiation actually penetrates the surface as well, uh, allowing for the photosynthetic activity of animals in the surface, which actually produce oxygen, and those are phytoplankton and other bacteria. And also, there's a lot of gas exchange, both carbon dioxide, nitrogen, oxygen, and argon, and other gases, including halogen gases, which are exchanged back and forth from the surface. Also, a lot of dust and, uh, and salt is sprayed both in and out of the ocean, into the oceans. Uh, winds create waves and currents and things like that. Uh, there's a lot of heat transfer and absorption happening at the ocean surface. Uh, the, earth, the oceans actually reflect a lot of the sunlight that hits them. And then it, after a long, long time of absorbing sunlight, it finally absorbs a lot of, a lot of that energy. And it takes a lot of energy to make it heat up. It's also the, at the ocean that receives the most amount of precipitation since it's so big. Considering about, uh, the rain of the world most likely tends to fall in those areas. But it also comes from the oceans, uh, the evaporation from the oceans. It's also, you also see a little bit of stress in the surface of the ocean. You also hit, see currents like, uh, um, like we talked about um, upwelling and downwelling, which is circulate the nutrients. And there's also wave and currents interactions, which is causing shuffling of the ocean water. And there's also um, um, shear and micro breaking of waves at the surface, even in the deep water. Lots of lots of things happening in the ocean, and you can take a whole course on each one of these things that is represented in this drawing. But anyways, let's get to business and let's talk about the uh, bas basic definition of an ocean current. Now, a current is a basically a body of water that flows in a particular motion and it has a particular chemical and physical composition. And so you see here in these drawings, you can see some examples of these currents that we're going to be learning about and discussing throughout this lecture. Here you see an example of an outflowing rip current and you can see that it's differentiated from the actual other currents that surround it. You can actually see that it's uh, carrying a lot of sediments out in, into the and you see another outcropping right there of the rip current. Uh, you see a representation here of a, of a heat current uh, stretching from the su South Africa into the, uh, mm -hmm. in, the, in, the, in the ocean. And you also see the pattern of, of circulation of this water, which creates storms, such as monsoons. And there's definitely a monsoon current uh, associated with this. And also, you see here an example of how the bentos that live in the bottom of the water have to constantly deal with the motions of, of such as wave motions and other motions like that, which create currents. An example of an Arctic current involved in the Arctic Circle. These are the Aleutianales there in the, in, in the uh, peninsula of of the um, Alaska and this is like uh, 
that's oh, the sea, the, basically the Bering Sea, which is the area that's, that's sometimes frozen in the water over the winter. And it has very peculiar currents as well. You see the, the description of the ocean currents or the great conveyor belt, which is down here. Both of these deep and surface currents are very important in distribution of heat and salinity across the world. And these are some examples of currents. Now, you remember that you define a current based on the chemical and physical composition of its waters, especially, especially in terms of salinity and temperature. And we will we'll be talking about that in more detail later. Now, you also have uh, here as a picture of our surface currents. Now, surface currents are currents which affect the first 200 to 300 meters of ocean water. Mostly, mostly you're talking about the photic zone and the parched parts of the of the picocline, and also referred to as uh, thermocline, which is the area where the surface water temperature suddenly drops. And one thing that's interesting about it, as you can see, is that these currents are rotating and moving around in the surface of the water, and there's patterns of rotation when you compare the southern versus the northern hemisphere. Now, what is actually causing these surface currents to be moving is the winds. Now, a little bit we reviewed that's actually important for this, then, therefore, is the idea of the global winds. Now, remember from the climate and weather chapter, we talked about the idea of the trade winds, which is a, a, a series of hot winds that carry heat from, um, uh, sorry, not the cold winds. We actually carry uh, uh, cold winds from the north. I don't know why they put it in uh, red in this drawing. I guess it's because it's in the tropic area. So they want you to understand that as the trade winds approach the equator, they're actually warming up. But they actually are cold winds that carry uh, cold from the polar air regions into the equator. And they converge in an area that's called the doldrums. Now remember that this, these doldrums actually travel up and down with the season. So this actually, the whole conveyor belt of winds actually fluctuates up and down. You also see the westerlies, which is a wind pattern that carries, uh, it's a, it goes towards, towards the east, coming from the west. That's why it's called westerlies. Winds are named after where they come from. And they carry heat from the pol polar regions towards the equator. So these westerlies are commonly carrying heat. Now remember that in this area here, which we call the horse latitudes, there's very little wind because the winds are leaving from the area. In the same way, there's very little wind in the doldrums since the winds are converging and canceling each other out of this area. But there are often storms, very bad cyclo cyclones and anticyclones that form in these areas when there is collisions between the, 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 the air masses. So there's very rarely problems, but when there are problems, they're the worst. And then you have the polar easterlies, which blow towards the west in the top, very fast moving winds, which cause very severe storms. Now remember also that this whole thing has to do with convection which is because when you have differential heating of one area being hotter than the other so you see in this picture here the bottom is much hotter than the top and since the top is losing heat you get this circling pattern of heat where the heat uh, it causes a, a decrease in density which causes the water to flow up and then when the, it gets colder the water flows back down a similar thing happens here because this area is constantly blasted by sunlight which makes it hotter that creates a pattern of heat uh, generation, which uh, is called the Hadley cells, where the waters actually, where the heat from the pole tropics actually escalates towards the poles. So you have both a horizontal flow of of winds uh, in the Earth, and you also have this vertical flow of winds up there, which transfer the heat around the Earth. And you see how these winds actually create patterns, and you can see how. Uh, the winds actually hit the continents and the trade winds first push the winds this way and then they finally go that way and you see the pattern uh, of the Gulf Stream which is going to be following this pattern now this is the paths of actually lots of tropical cyclones and hurricanes which are formed and this is a historical markings of all these storms and the pattern that you can see actually is the formation of this of this overall pattern of motion which mimics what's happening with the trade winds and westerlies and in the ocean circulation system. And you just say, uh, you have a, a little bit of su sudden tr cyclones here in the Pacific as well. Now also I'd point out that there's actually a large area right here in the middle that does not have a lot of activity and that's where we, we refer to as the doldrums. And you see that there featured. Now, the, uh, 
Why am I reviewing global winds before I even start talking about our surface currents? Because the, the, sur the surface currents are caused mostly by these global winds. And you will see in the next drawing when we compare the both of two together that it's in fact the surface winds are the ones that are actually pushing the wind, the, the, uh, the currents in the direction that they go. One last thing that we'd like to talk about in reference to the wind currents is that the combination of the vertical and the horizontal uh, fluctuation of winds actually creates a pattern of wind transference that looks something like this in the US. Uh, I don't know if I aligned it properly, but I want you to understand that this fluctuating pattern of the northern hemisphere is, is all part of the circulation system. Uh, which is basically a combination of the vertical and horizontal motions which are happening. Now, now you see here a picture of those currents, those surface currents that we were talking about, and you see uh, deleting the continents, how, the, how they, they actually move around, and you see these patterns of actual uh, circulation that happens in the ocean, and th they refer to the heat patterns around the ocean. Now, these are actually wind patterns, not ocean patterns, and you can see the areas of high pressure and low pressure around the world. And then you will see that the currents, uh, especially the GEs, which is the circulating per currents on the, on the oceans, are going to be related to these, to these uh, pressure zones. And we're going to talk about that on this next slide. Now let's look at how these currents actually line up. Now what I'm doing here is I'm superimposing uh, an image of the global belts, including the Hadley cells and the trade winds and westerlies. And this thing, and I actually put here a picture of the sun and uh, and of the of the of the Earth being heated by the sun, to show you that because the Earth is a sphere, the this area up here is reflects indirect sunlight when compared to the area in the center, which reflects direct sunlight. That's what creates differential heating, which creates the convection cells of the of the wind circulation patterns. But notice that the circulation of the ocean, marked in green, mimics what's happening with the circulation of the winds. Notice that these winds here, the trade winds push the currents, the ocean currents, that way. But then they hit the continents and are forced to move up, where they actually hit the westerlies, which then push the currents that way, and the process restarts. But since the Coriolis effect is opposite on the, on the southern hemisphere, what you get is the opposite. Again, the currents will, will go in this direction. When they hit the continent, they will be forced to go south and hit the westerlies and then go this way. Which means in the northern hemisphere, you will see the currents going in a clockwise direction. And then the, uh, in the, and then the southern hemisphere, you'll see the currents moving in a counterclockwise reaction because of the Coriolis effect, because of that circulation uh, of wind patterns caused by the fact that the Earth is rotating. Remember that the whole time, the Earth is actually spinning, and because it's spinning around its axis, it actually creates a circulation of any wind pattern that's actually trying to go south, like the trade winds are, actually ends up circling like this. And then the, wind, the ocean currents will follow the same pattern as the Coriolis rotation. All right? And so if, if you ask yourself what actually causes these circulation patterns in the surface of the water, you would have to say it's a combination of a lot of things. First, obviously, local and global wind patterns, especially the trade winds and the westerlies, are going to be the ones which are going to be pushing these currents in the directions that you saw before. And also, the fact that the Earth rotates and spins is going to create what we call a Coriolis force, where because the water is not actually attached to the Earth, the Coriolis force of the Earth's rotation actually creates, uh, so imagine that the Earth's gravity is constantly pulling the ocean towards the center of the Earth. Meanwhile, the rotation of the Earth is throwing the oceans out uh, by centrifugal force. The effect is that the formation of these bulges, all right, and then the current cannot go straight, but has to go around these bulges and form a circulating pattern. And basically what happens, because it's the, what mimics what happens when you travel from an airplane and the earth is spinning. Because the earth is spinning, you cannot exit and leave in the same place you got if you try to go in a straight line. You will end up doing something like this because the earth uh, is moving in that direction at the same time that you're trying to move, sorry, in that direction. So that, that's why you end up getting that effect. Now also, 
continents also are a great part of the reason why currents flow in the way they flow because the continents block the motion of these currents. And notice here, for example, on the North Atlantic Giri, that the equatorial currents end up hitting North America and then are forced to diverge and go north and then complete the Giri that way. And the same thing happens across the entire world in all sorts of continents. You get these circulating patterns, which happen because of the added effect of westerlies, trade winds, Coriolis effect, and continental blockage. All right? And notice that when you don't have the continental blockage, you can actually get a constant, continuous current circulating the entire world. We'll talk more about these currents on the next chapter and uh, video and also introduce the concept of deep ocean currents. I'll see you then.